Okay, so um, what, what we want to do, do is uh, take a look at the connection between the area underneath the curve and rates of change. Because that's the easiest way to just conceptualize um, what we're going to do next with the fundamental theorem of calculus and, and everything that integrals are used for. So uh, let's say, for example, you have a, uh, a car that's driving at um, this velocity. So at zero seconds, the car is going uh, 20 feet per second. At uh, four seconds, for example, it's going 38 feet per second. And then it goes up to uh, 10 seconds, and then it's going at 50 feet per second. Okay, now take a look at this. Let's say we, we uh, do a couple of these uh, little rectangles, uh, like when we did the Riemann sum. Let me just draw this first one. Um, so notice that to find the, um, the area of this rectangle, I would multiply the width, which is uh, 2, times the height, which is 20. Right? But now take a look at the units. This is 2 seconds, and this is 20 feet per second. Now what happens when you multiply 20, 2 seconds times 20 feet per second? You get feet. Hmm, that's interesting. So this 2 times 20 is equal to 40 corresponds to the, it's an approximation of course, but it's an approximation of the, of the distance the car has traveled in those first two seconds. Okay, and then if you do the same thing again, notice you would get, you know, uh, 2 times 30 this time, which is 60. And so what you're doing is this, so your, your Riemann sum, now this is an approximation, this is the left-hand approximation, but if you add up all of the area of these rectangles, you're approximating the distance traveled. The distance traveled, this is absolutely key. So what you have is if your function is interpreted as a velocity or a rate of change, then the area underneath the curve, the area underneath the curve is equal to, it's representing the distance that it has traveled. Interesting, very, very interesting. So this might not seem like that important, but it, it's relating to things that are seemingly have nothing to do with one another. I mean, if you, if I told you the area underneath the curve is equal to the distance traveled, you would probably say, well, why, right? But it makes sense when you're thinking about it in terms of uh, these uh, rectangles, right? Okay, so we're going to use that idea um, when, we're, uh, when we're explaining the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, we're going to conceptually show what, what the fundamental theorem of calculus is. So this isn't really a proof per se, but it's an explanation of why, it, why it's true and uh, how it works. So take a, a basic function. Let's say this is f of uh, t. And um, let, me, let me write down the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I'll let you ask me why. So um, basically we have if f of t uh, is uh, continuous on uh, the closed interval from a to b. So let's draw that over here. Let's say this is. Uh, a and this is B. So if f of t is continuous on the interval from A to B, then the integral, the integral from A to B of f of t dt 
Now I'm writing t just because we're going to interpret it as time, but it could be any variable, um, is equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A, where um, capital F of T, capital F prime of T is equal to F of T. So in other words, AKA capital F of T is the antiderivative, antiderivative of f of t. Whoa, okay, so what you're saying, what the fundamental theorem of calculus says, and don't worry, you, you don't know enough to fully appreciate how important this is, but, but with time you will. But what this is basically saying is that if you want to find the integral from a to b of f of t dt, or in other words, if you want to find the area underneath the curve from A to B, what you simply have to do is find the antiderivative of that function, and you're going to subtract the value of the antiderivative, which is capital F, the value of the antiderivative at the ending point minus the value of the antiderivative at the starting point. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is that so great? I mean, it's just the area under the curve. Who cares? Well, what I have to say to that is you will see. You will see. I mean, this is absolutely insanely awesome. That's all I've got to say. But you don't know enough to fully appreciate that yet. But you will. No, not to worry. Okay. Now, for the explanation. How could this possibly be? This doesn't make any sense at all, right? That's what you're thinking? Okay. So let me... Um, let me try to explain it for you. Think of this right here as the velocity. So this function, this blue function that we have, think of that as velocity. And uh, so here, just like we had in the previous example, um, so the vertical axis represents velocity, and then the horizontal axis represents uh, time. Now we already uh, showed you how the area underneath the curve represents the distance traveled. So we showed you that just uh, a few moments ago, right? Okay, but, but let's forget about that for a second. Just, just put that out of your mind right now. And just think of a, so forget about all the calculus that you know and just put yourself back into the spot of a normal person before you uh, started learning calculus. Okay? And let's say we have this uh, little person, boy or girl, either one, um, is walking along. And let's say this spot right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a, uh, a line here. And so let's say this is, you know, let's just say zero feet. And let's say this uh, little person is uh, starting off at 3. And then over here is 13. And so, you know, our little guy right here is walking along from the point 3 feet to the point 13 feet. And so he walks along and he arrives here exhausted. Okay. Now how far, I know this is so, so, so simple. It's, why am I asking you this? So how far did he go? If he started at 3, ended at 13, how far did he travel? How far? You might say, well, duh, 10 feet, right? Okay, well, yeah, how did you get to 10 feet? Well, if you started at 3 and ended at 13, well, you got to 10 because you subtracted 13 feet minus 3 feet, right? And there is the key right there. Because 13 represents the final position. Let me, I need a little bit more room here. 
This represents the final position, right? The final position. This represents the starting position. Okay, but how does it, what does that have to do with everything else? So, basically, if you want to find the distance that you've traveled, all you need to do, if you know your position, all you need to do is subtract the final position minus the starting position. Okay? So what we're saying is that you have velocity here, and if you wanted to find the distance traveled, or the area under the curve, which is interpreted as the distance traveled, all you need to do is you need to know the final position and then subtract the starting position. And there's the key. If this is velocity, how do you find the position given the velocity? Well, the position is the antiderivative is the antiderivative anti d of velocity right so we've done that before where to find the position if you know the velocity all you need to do is you find the antiderivative of it so basically what this is doing is you're finding the antiderivative of the velocity that's how you're interpreting this and then you're plugging in the, the, the value at the end, which is your final position. So the interpretation of this one is this is the final position minus the starting position. I mean, that's just nuts. If, you, if I would have told you that these two, the area under the curve and distance traveled, and they're connected in this way, if I would have told you that a week ago, you would have said I'm nuts. But you might have already thought that anyways. But anyways, so that's the connection. To find the area underneath the curve, you find the antiderivative and plug in end minus the beginning, or also top minus bottom. And so it might take a little while for you to appreciate all of the implications that this has, but, but this is a, amazing, truly amazing. Now this is only the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's do some examples of uh, putting this into place and uh, then we'll look at the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus.